All right, here we are today. Uh, Robbie, we're going to have a lot of fun today, buddy. We've got uh, an amazing, amazing person uh, on, online with us here with Ann Hyatt. And uh, boy, she's, she's been around some really, really cool businesses and around uh, some of the best leadership minds and, and technology and, and business that I, that I, I can ever imagine. Um, so I, we're excited to get going and talk to Ann about uh, her, her past and, and her, her current and her future. Um, so Ann, uh, welcome on board to Ditch Digger CEO. Thanks for, Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited about it. So, so Ann, as you know, um, you know we, we just kind of we just want to dig into who Ann is, who Ann Hyatt is, and uh, where it all began, and uh, you know talk about some of the mentors here in your life, what you do today to, uh, to 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 mentor or share your experiences as you're going to be doing with us today. Um, so if uh, boy, if we can just get going right from the start, and we want to find out, you know, who was this, who is this this young girl today? How she got all this crazy experience? And, uh, you know, who are the people that shaped her, her paradigm? So if you could start, start maybe from the beginning as, as far as, uh, you know, what, and your, your upbringing and stuff. Love to hear that. Yeah. My family is definitely a huge part of who I am today. They're the foundation upon which I've built everything. I was born, going back to day one, uh, I was born in Tampa, Florida on McDill Airport, Air Force Base. My dad was a um, new, newly trained fighter pilot, and he was there getting his F-4 fighter jet. Uh, when I was born. So that's how I got started. My dad is, I am actually first generation non-farmer in my family. From the beginning of time, they've always been farmers. Uh, my family's from Scandinavia. They immigrated to the States, continued farming. But my dad saw his father have several heart attacks and the lifestyle was really tough. Everyone in his family's genius level intelligent and um but he's the only of the four brothers that, that left farming, although they all have advanced degrees in engineering and chemical engineering, things like that. Um, so my dad didn't think that lifestyle was for him. And so he just embraced the American dream and thought, what's the coolest thing I can think of doing if I'm not going to be a farmer and he wants to be a fighter jet pilot. Oh, wow. So he did it. <laughs> That's a long story. But um, I think that instilled in me this um, ability to not be afraid of setting huge goals and accomplishing something that no one you know has ever done before. It's, it's not only had no one in our family done it, he didn't know anyone who was a pilot, let alone a fighter pilot. So, so did, did, um, he read, did he read up about flying and fighting and uh, you know, flying a fighter jet? I mean, how does that happen? That's amazing. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a, he's a classic like World War One, World War Two buff, and he grew up during the draft for Vietnam. So I think our family's always um, been very committed to our communities and um, contributing. And I think the military was a natural fit for that desire to, to mm -hmm. give back to a society that had created this new life of opportunities for our families. And um, so I think it was just, it was a good fit in that. He just, he loved, you know, the engineering side of flying and was really inspired to do something to serve his country. It was cool. a big motivation for him. Was it your grandparents that were immigrants then, Ann, or who, who were the... Um, he was third generation. So yeah, in the late 18, in the 1880s, our, um, my family, both sides, actually, my mom's family, my dad's family emigrated from Scandinavia around the same time. Not that cool. Uh -huh. um, and, and, uh, and, and so, so it was your, your dad's family, though, parents were farmers in, in, uh, in what state? Both sides, actually. My parents met when my dad was working on my mom's family farm. Oh. Um, they were, they located, were in Idaho and they did potato farming and sheep. My, my mom's family did potatoes and sheep and my dad's family did potatoes and cattle. And so, wow. that's how they yeah. Wow. yeah. Awesome. <laughs> uh, they, are they still there in Idaho? No. So my family, after the air force, um, my dad was in the military for about 10 years. And after that, they, okay. he went to law school, became a lawyer and, um, they settled in Seattle. So I've lived there since I was about 10. Okay. It's not so far from Idaho if they ever want to go back to there. Do you have any family in Idaho anymore? Yeah, um, we used to go every summer. Well, my friends were going to like Hawaii and Mexico for vacation. I went to my grandparents' farm every summer where I was expected to do chores <laughs> and uh, contribute just like everyone else on the farm. Um, all of my cousins, aunts and uncles still live there. But uh, yeah. Is that, is, that, is that near Boise, Idaho? Yeah, yeah, they're from Idaho Falls. Mm -hmm. oh, I love that area. I, I, my friend has a, a ranch out there that, that we've gone to a couple of times. It's so awesome. That's such a beautiful area. So, yeah. I, 
I mean, you, you don't, you don't, uh, but your family didn't uh, didn't choose any any flat land, any, you know, ugly flat lands anyway. They went to Seattle next, and to, to, to that's see right. The beauty of Seattle, which is awesome as well. And that move changed my life in a way they never could have anticipated. Because we actually live in Redmond, um, we moved there just after Microsoft was founded. Our house is kind of now in the middle of what is a very sprawling Microsoft campus. My parents chose Redmond because my dad got hired with a law firm in downtown Seattle, but they're not city folk. So there's no way they were going to live downtown. So they went to Redmond because we could get this big plot of land. Our neighbors had horses. My mom planted a huge garden in the back. And our house is still that way. Like everyone else is subdivided and sub, you know, their, their plots. But my parents are still there on Education Hill right in the heart of Redmond. And then this tech boom happened around us. Yes. Most of the friends of my parents in high school worked in tech. So I've been exposed to that in all my impressionable years. And I had no idea that that was going to become my future. In fact, it didn't look like a lot of fun in the late 90s when it was real crunch time and they were inventing the future of, of personal computing. Um, I saw a lot of my friends' parents be really stressed. So when I was, I went to University of Washington for undergrad. And while I was there, I, I graduated in 2002, so just after the dot-com bust. Nobody in my graduating class had um, an offer or even an internship upon graduation because the economy was still suffering so much. So and, 19, um, what was that, 1901? So the bust was between, was right around the 2000s, and so I graduated in 2002. Okay. So everyone had lost all their investment monies. Most of the startups had disappeared. Yep. The economy was really struggling in places like Seattle because it was such a tech hub. And so I worked at the European Union Center, one of my many jobs while I was an undergrad. And the director of that program asked me right before graduation what I was going to do after I finished school because uh, it was a student position. And um, I didn't know I had applied a lot of places, but I hadn't even heard it back anything. Um, and so he said, well, have you thought of applying at Amazon? And I, I, I think I wrinkled my face and was like, mm, I don't, I don't think so. <laughs> it, just, it, it didn't appeal to me at first, but his wife was, um, in recruiting at Amazon. He's like, I think you'd be a good fit. Like they, they like your kind of thinkers. And I just was like, sure. And I kind of sent a resume without thinking about it. And yeah, very whatever, long whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> okay. What position was that for? Sorry. Say again. What, what position was that for that you were applying at that time? It, I think it was for a junior assistant. I had no experience as an assistant whatsoever. And it was a very generic description. So this is kind of a weird thing about tech, and it remains true today at most large tech companies, where you apply for a general category, and they just want to find smart people, and then they find the right job that fits you, so your personality, your temperament, your how you fit into a team's culture. And so they're just interviewing really for skills. So the general category I was, uh, applied for was assistant. And um, it's a long story, but the mini version of it is um, nine months later, I was hired as the junior most assistant to Jeff Bezos, the founder. It was through three rounds, each separated by three months. So that's why it took so long. Um, yeah, it was intense. The first round was with all of the assistants in the company, all the senior assistants. I think there were like 11 at the time. And then um, I didn't hear anything back for three months at all. And so I thought, okay, so that didn't work out. At least I got an interview, got some interesting practice. I continued looking for jobs. Second time, they called me three months later, and they had me come in and interview with all the SVPs in the company. And I thought, this is an enormous waste of time. Why would they be talking to me? Uh, it doesn't seem like good use of resources. Um, but what I didn't know is I had done really well. And um, Jeff was needing a new member of his team. And so because I had scored well, he wanted his SVPs to kind of test me out. What I didn't know at the time was they, three of them had been assigned to make me cry. They wanted to find my breaking point to see if I could handle the stress and the pace yeah. and if I could handle myself. Um, but this is where my Redmond upbringing comes to an advantage because I knew a lot of people who are kind of on the spectrum. They're not like socially very graceful. So I just talked to them to that and I thought like, well, that guy's a little rude, but you know, no personal offense taken. <laughs> um, That's awesome. and so I did okay. I held my own. And then three months after that, they brought me in. I remember when the recruiter called, she, she said, hey, we want to bring you in for one more round. And I said, look, at this point you have, I think it was 23 data points on me. You like me, you don't. I'm a fitter, I'm not. And she was like, no, I promise, just one more. I'm sorry. Um, so I said, okay. I came in and at this point, had, I finally had another offer from another company. 
And I came in and uh, they didn't tell me I was going to interview with Jeff. She just took me all the way up to the 15th floor. We were in, back then we were in the Pac Med building, a former hospital, right up at the top of the hill overlooking all of downtown Seattle. And um, they put me in this conference room and Jeff walked in and I thought, my honest reaction was, well, this is going to be embarrassing. They put me in the wrong room. (laughs) I thought thought he was going to be like, oh, you're not this engineer. And my fears kind of continued because he sat down and he's like, hi, Anne, nice to meet you. Um, I promise I'm only going to ask you two questions. And he's like, first one's one's going to be a brain teaser. And then he, he stood up and he had all four walls were a whiteboard. He stood up, uncapped a pen, and he was like, don't worry, I'll do the math. And I thought, well, for sure, he's expecting an engineer. What are we doing math for? Um, I got nervous. But he just asked me, um, he asked me to estimate the number of panes of glass in the city of Seattle. And I thought, I was kind of panicked for a second, and I thought, okay, why is he asking me that? And I thought, okay, you just want to see the way my brain works. Can I take a complex problem, break it down into manageable steps, and not freak out? So I told him how I would break it down and how I would approach it. And I thought that would be that. No, we filled all of those whiteboards with the math. It felt like it take, took hours. I'm sure it was minutes. But uh, we finally got to an answer. He circled it, capped the pen, sat down and said, I think that sounds about right. And then his second question was just like, tell me about you and, and what you want to do here. And by then, because I'd met so many people and I'd done my homework on the company, I wanted it bad. And I think I... People ask me all the time, like, why would Jeff take a chance on, I had no experience, no technical abilities, no, I didn't know anything about Amazon. Um, and they asked me, why, did, why would he take that risk? And I, I wish I had asked him, but the, the answer I've made up in my head is, I think he liked that I was smart and asked good questions. I could break down com- complex things without getting frazzled. Um, I could hold my own among people who were very senior to me. And um, I was really hungry to learn. Like I knew that this was an opportunity to get on the rocket ship. And I didn't care what seat it was. Junior most person on the wing would have been fine. Um, But I just wanted it. And I think he felt that. And I also wasn't like starstruck by him. He had been time man of the year in 1999. And everyone in Seattle knew him. He was, you know, one of the first celebrity CEOs. um, So I definitely knew who he was. And I think a lot of people didn't talk to him like a normal, regular person and got flustered around him. Sure. Uh, here I was, this like 20 year old who was like, whatever, you hire me, you don't. So, and I'm so glad. So, how much of it do you, I mean, do you believe was, I mean, I, mean, I, I can envision, you know, if I'm, if I'm looking to hire somebody and their you know, father's a, parents is a fighter pilot, they're, they come from a farming, farming family, hard work, right? Uh, you know, just just a brief story you told your history says character, says great character, says grittiness also, right? I mean, we all, you know, we all want people that are compassionate to, to be on our team. We all want people that, that are smart, right? But you get, grit's an important thing, right? To have, you have, you have a backbone, not to be offended by as much as some people are, right? We need Absolutely. people at our side that, that, you know, can take a punch and then, and then give it back or, you know, just take the punch and... and uh, and, and be smarter, you know, learn from it, whatever that is, right? So again, I, 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 I see that you know, automatically in you. I'm, I'm guessing that he did a lot more homework than we're talking about, and he knew all about you, right? He knew all about your family, your background, the grittiness that, that I can tell you have already, right? Yeah, so I think another factor of that is the fact that I'm the oldest of seven children. Oh, so wow. You gotta like hold your own be a self-starter be independent oh, yeah. work well and autonomous uh, autonomously and you have to be highly collaborative because if you Absolutely. want anything to work you've got to get people on your team you've got to get everyone organized because goodness knows like no one was going to do it for me so I think that's a huge part of where I get my organizational skills my creativity my communication skills and I'm you know I'm a Libra if if that means anything to you like I'm definitely a balancer I want everyone to be happy I want everyone to kind of be um, used to their best abilities, and that's a big part of how I collaborate and, and a big part of how I manage up, which is the tricky part when you're, you know, the least powerful person in the company whose job description is to, is to basically boss around the most important person in the company. Sure. And, well, but, but, and you also saw a father, right, that, that uh, was a leader in life that, mm-hmm. that had to answer to, to extreme leaders, right, and be respectful but probably challenge, be objective, right? So besides being a leader in your family, you watched this leader in your life, probably, I'm guessing. I'm just guessing, right? I did. Hold himself accountable and, and uh, you know, take, take the heat sometimes and take responsibility. Maybe when it wasn't even his responsibility, right? These are all character traits. 
these are all character traits that that create uh, you know amazing leaders here, you know themselves. So I mean, I, these are these are things I look for in leaders all the time, right? Military. I, I love the military. I, there's one thing I'll if I there's one thing I regret in my life as I look back is I didn't you know join the military at some point in my life. But uh, but I, but I but I uh, I love and honor my my friends and my family that have served and anybody that served, right? Is it's it's a, it's the coolest thing you can do, in my opinion, is give that you know, the highest level, you know, your potentially your life for your country. So so I God bless my, your dad. God bless your dad. Oh, thank I, you. I, I, if, I love you a, <laughs> if my dad ever has a hard day, all we have to do is ask him to tell us a Air Force story, and he perks right up and gets a huge smile. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think. That upbringing absolutely is influential on me, where my priorities are, my temperament, my personality. You're absolutely right about the heavy dose of humility that has to come. It's interesting to watch him because he was with the elite of the elite of the elite in the Air Force. And it's interesting because those people have to have big egos because you're, you're, you know, many of them are 18, 20 year olds who are then going to be flying billion dollar machines. And you have to have some dose of ego and confidence that like, give it to me, put me in that seat. I want to be the one, you know, the maverick kind of personalities. But my dad, actually, I didn't plan on telling the story, but the truth it, it seems to flow here. So my dad, we were stationed in Alaska. After I was born in Florida, we moved to Alaska. My next two sisters were born there. When we were what, in Alaska. What, 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 we're in Alaska. What? Uh, Anchorage. Was it? Anchorage, Alaska. Okay, all right. In Elmendorf Air Force Base. Yeah. Right. And um, <laughs> while we were in Elmendorf. Um, some movie producers were writing a movie about pilots and they wanted to understand the lingo as they were crafting the script. So they got permission to get the cockpit recordings from my dad's um, squadron. And so a year and a half later, when the movie was coming out, the Air Force was like, you know what, we're not sure, we're super comfortable with this. Like they pulled the permission to refer to the Air Force. The movie came out with it being Navy pilots. That movie was Top Gun. My dad's call name is Goose. I he flew with Maverick and Iceman. I grew up, with, I mean, in the neighborhood together. Like that's the people that formed my childhood. Wow. <laughs> so <it's a> <laughs> that's my claim to fame. That's my good party story. If I want it, if everyone. Oh, that's awesome. How, how long were you in Anchorage, Anne? <laughs> we were there for six years. Long time. I love Anchorage. The- I love. I. I uh, Cold War. We, so we we have a one of our businesses, our one of our bigger larger businesses. We paved parking lots all over the country. And so we, my, my uh, son, I think, was running the business at the time or much. No, it was another. Anyway, the, the leader of the business at the time, um, I tell him, if you get some jobs to run that are, you know, in places I like, like Hawaii or Anchorage or whatever, just give me a shot. If, I, if you can tell me ahead of time, I can push everything aside and go run the job and have some fun, bring my wife and family there and all that. And so sure enough, it went one day, he said, I got a job in Anchorage. I said, wow, what is it? He told me when it was. It was like a month away. I said, I'm going to schedule around. I'm going to run that job. So sure enough, I did that. And uh, we spent, it was supposed to be a two and a half, three week job, but I, I pushed things pretty hard. Got it done like a little over a week. But I, we loved the week there. I had my wife come, my, my, my son, who was my adopted son, our youngest is very young then. And my, one of my, my daughters, who actually runs our companies today, Janelle. Uh, flew out for four or five days to be there too, but it was so much fun. Uh, I, I worked. I pushed all the work at night because it was light all day. It was only dark for like mm-hmm. an hour or night or something like that at the time. And uh, so pushed all the work at, at night, and then in the daytime we were able to travel and to go all over the Anchorage area to, to check out so many cool things. It's such a beautiful, beautiful part of our our, our, our world, you know. So that'd be a bu- yeah. blessing to be there. Huh? Some of my best memories. I mean, it's such a beautiful place to be a kid. Now, my dad sounds like. He's got all the glamorous side of it, but obviously he's on flight for months at a time. A couple of years in a row, he missed Christmas and Thanksgiving. And it's just, it was a real sacrifice. My mom was the reason it all held together. And my mom was very young when they got married. She's eight years younger than him. And she was suddenly pulled out of this farm life she'd known her entire life and dragged all over the country. And my dad was here and then not here. And then she had the, all these little kids. And she created this beautiful creative environment for us. She's an artist. She's an oil painter. Um, learned that from both of her parents were oil, oil painters as well. And she just inserted this creativity into our life and ev- in such rich ways. She's the other half. I'm a, I'm a good blend of my, my per- parents' personalities. For my dad, I get my very analytical side and my, my drive, like this thing I just can't turn off to like always be better, do more, get you know higher. And then for my mom, I get like the emotional intelligence, the creativity, the appreci- appreciation for beauty and people and uh, community. And so, yeah, she created this great environment for us where while it was very hectic and 
you know, some very intense things happened while we were there. A couple of my dad and people in their squadron died in a training accident while we were there. And it was really, it was intense. And a lot of kids had a hard time, you know, with constantly moving, but she just created this base for us that was really grounding. And um, yeah, she would take us on adventures. She wasn't going to sit around and wait for dad to do that. She would tie bells on our shoes and we'd go hiking, hiking in the hills behind our house. And the bells were so we wouldn't scare any bears because they were everywhere or we'd go fishing or we'd go, we'd plant a garden. We just had this well-crafted childhood to make sure that we had a sense of stability and self. What, a, what an amazing blessing is that, you know, again, I, we, I, I mentor a bunch of different people that are business leaders, you know, from very small to mid midsize, let's say business leaders. And I, and we have um, 10 different organizations within the Ravine group. So I have all the, the CEOs and, and leaders, presidents, GMs, and, and so what I find is exact what you just said makes the best CEO because, uh, you know, we, I, I, can, I can tell you, we, we had a gentleman on earlier, Nick uh, Matthew was on our show here because Nick, uh, Nick is an amazing young leader, um, but he's got both right side, left side brain. He, he's very analytical. He's, an engin- he's a civil engineer with a, a PE and a civil engineer with an MBA. Did it all while he worked, right? Didn't didn't just go to you know regular co- con- uh, conventional way. He actually worked and went to school the whole way. Bottom line is this: this guy uh, we hired, and I realized he's very smart. So I wanted to leave one of our businesses, and eventually did. But what the, the coolest thing was, he had this cre- creative side and this entrepreneurial mind, and and this this compassion for people and the ability to inspire, right? So engineers, are, we have to have a lot of engineers in our businesses, and, and we love engineers, but it's hard to find engineers that wanna inspire and have that have that uh that that creative side too so nick is that and nick is growing this little business that we started with we started from nothing uh, nick was doing a, uh, a little bit of business on the side before he came to work for us and it's called pipe televising where we put robots underground we televise the condition of pipe so it's kind of like a tech service construction business it's a it's a weird it fits in a weird category but Nick has the tech mind. He's got the engineering mind. He's got the inspirational mind. And so he's growing this business in leaps and bounds. And in the, in the, in the tough tech economy that is today, over the last couple of months, he's hired 25 people. And, and our, any competitors are, are laying people off, right? So, so anyway, it's so much fun to watch somebody with both right side, left side brain work because it, it's, uh, it's a blessing. Uh, usually, if you're, if, you're strong, if you're strong on the inspirational and vision side like I am, right, I need people around me that have that the organizational skill, the strategy skill, and, and execution skill, and uh, I'm constantly thinking that way because I'm good at I'm good at execution initially to build the plan, but then I want to get out of the way, and I want to think of the next thing, right? And I want to what, what's next? What's next? Um, I wish I had a little more of, of you know the organizational skills that you have combined because I might be a little more dangerous that way. So, so <laughs> I I love I love I love uh, you know how, how you put that. But yeah, so sorry about that. Go, uh, if we, no, uh, I like that. Go, continue. No, I think that's so that. true. So they, so they definitely saw this in you. T- tell us uh, you know where it went from that from that that 2001 or two was that you went out, you came on board. 2002. I started at Amazon, and at the time it was very different from the Amazon we all know today. It was yeah. not yet profitable. They had had one single quarter that was profitable, but overall still losing money. A very anxious board of directors because they had lost all their money invested everywhere else in the dot-com bust. And so all their chips are in with Jeff and all the faith and value of the company is based on a faith in Jeff. And he was well-deserving of that. He still is. Um, he is just an exceptional human and unlike anyone else I've ever met. Um, so I was there for a couple of months and I um, started to be, I started to realize how terrified I should be having this job because I had no idea what I was doing. Not, a, not only did I not know how to do my job, but I didn't know what Amazon was supposed to do. What, what did success look like? What was Jeff working on? And so I just decided, okay, I'm going to treat this like school. I know how to do school well. So I'm going to come in before anyone else. I'm going to read every briefing document, every single email in his inbox. I'm going to Google all the terms I don't know and all the people I don't know. And I'm just going to, because Jeff was a, this is a commonality between all the CEOs that I've worked for, but they, he's, um, he's insatiably curious and he's an avid reader and he just consumes massive amounts of information. So any book I saw him carrying or newspapers, he read every day, the New York times, the wall street journal, the Seattle times. So, so did I, I just wanted to fill my head with all the data I needed to just have an impact there. I knew I was in way over my head, but I loved it. So it was in that environment where I had my first big project and it was 
if anyone has heard me speak anywhere else, you've heard this story, but I, um, one of my first big projects was I didn't know, and nobody knew at the time, that Jeff was building his private space tourism company, Blue Origin. And he wanted to go to Texas to buy some property. He asked me to help him with that. And so um, long story short, I hired my first helicopter. Jeff went down to Texas, viewed five or six different properties, came back super excited. I mean, Jeff is like a zero or 100. He's most of the time he's at 100. There's nothing in between. And he came back just really excited with, about what he was building. Um, and he said, great, next week I want to go back. I mean, I've narrowed it down to two of these properties. I'm going to buy one. And so I was like, oh, cool. I've got a helicopter guy now. I've never done that before, but I was starting. <laughs> helicopter guy, very good. I've got, that was not in my Rolodex prior to working at <laughs> Amazon. But I, um, yeah, I was getting more comfortable with like private jets and helicopters and all that stuff. So in the second trip, um, the short story of it is I was sitting at my desk early in the morning, same thing, the only person in the building doing all my self-imposed homework and my desk phone rang and it was his jet pilot. And they said, I don't want to alarm you, but we've had an emergency beacon go off for a helicopter crash. They're in the middle of nowhere. My hands start shaking. It's obviously him. And I don't know yet if he, it wasn't him or if he's dead, if he's alive, but seriously injured. And I thought, okay, I'm 20. <laughs> I've been at this company for four months. I just killed Jeff Bezos. <laughs> I, that's it. Someone's going to fire me today. Like, I think that's a fireable offense. <laughs> Um, so I called my first emergency board meeting. Nobody knew who I was. I've been there four months. They didn't know my name. Um, but yeah, we put together an emergency board meeting to be prepared no matter what the scenario was. Um, and luckily he, once I finally tracked him down, um, he was fine. Obviously he's fine. And, um, he just said, he did the board meeting, told them not to do any proactive statements because he was trying to keep it real quiet while he was in Texas to build Blue Origin. Cause this is in the height of the space race when we were doing like the SpaceX was entering the space, doing the X Prize. This is in the top of, of that competitive space. And he didn't want Elon Musk and other crazies to know he was going to be jumping into that as well. So once he talked the board out of doing anything proactively, he asked to speak to me. And I thought, well, this is the moment that <laughs> you're going to fire me now. Um, and instead, he just said, um, Anne, I hear you're really good under pressure. And he might have said something after that, but I think I like my ears started ringing. It was like the nice thing anyone's ever said to me. I will never forget it. And um, that was an important moment. I'm, I'm actually glad it happened. I wouldn't ever want that day again. It remains the worst day of my professional life. But I, um, it was a turning point. And even though I was only a few months into this job, it changed the way that he saw me. I was no longer the 20-year-old who had no idea what she was doing. I was someone who could be relied on to do really hard things and keep a cool head. And more importantly, it changed the way I saw myself. And so, so I just thought, all right, I'm going to jump in. I'm going to ask the right questions. And it, um, anytime I had a hard day, there were many after that. Right. I would always have this reality check of being like, well, it's not a helicopter crash. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> that so That changed awesome. everything. For the, so, for the so next two and a half years I was there, I was there three, almost three years. And it, that changed everything. I got thrown into projects that were way above my pay grade. I didn't really do my job description anymore. It was just like special projects and coordinating stuff on, on his behalf and with his, his shadow. And um, so, yeah, so, Anne, Anne, so, so, Anne, um, just to, just to, to, to chime in here, I mean, I, I talked about to the, this to Bonnie, and I've talked to other people. I've got uh, many friends of mine that are women CEOs, they're awesome, awesome leaders. And they and I and I'm I'm in forum in YPO forum with a couple, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what I noticed and I, I talked to my daughter about this, my wife about this, my assistant, who are who are all amazing leaders that just you know get it done. And and, and what I see in, in them and I see in so many so many really smart women is is they they don't jump right in if they don't have all the answers or most of the answers right when. When a dumbass like me, right? I mean, I, I, I never had all the answers, and I and I and I, I would say, gosh, if I if I knew twenty percent of something, I would raise my hand to lead something in a leadership organization I'm, I'm in, or of course my own business. It was natural, just lead wherever I I, I had to. But uh, I, I I see so many uh, you know, women around me that are so much smarter than me. If it's not that tough, but me, and then and other men around me. But often they're, they're not raising their hand because they don't know 95 or 98 percent of the the, 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 the yeah. challenges ahead. They might only know 10 or 15 percent, right? And and then and then a, a man next to them will will raise their hand. So I got this. I, I'll I'll take this on. And 
you can look at the person. No, they don't have five percent of the, the, the challenges. The answer, the answers of, of the challenges they had, but but they, they're the ones who raise their hand. So again, what do you say for as far as that goes? I mean, because you you know you jumped into this and and uh, you knew you had to you know just dive in and learn everything you could. Um, but but again, it, it probably became your history from there on, where you just said, eh, "I got it. Okay, I, I got it. I know I can study the, the, the subject matter of, and find the right people and look for the right people." And I, I you, know, you probably very often raise your hand after this point, right? And saw your saw your dad is this and your mom is this in the beginning anyway, or you wouldn't have done what you did. So right. can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, I I would love to say that I'm an expert at this, and I don't have those moments of like pause or holding back or doubting myself. I mean. High performing people always experience imposter syndrome and that there's just no escaping that. That's just part of the burden you have when you're putting yourself out there. Um, but I, I am conscious of that fact. And I, my entire career in tech for 15 years was mm, most of my days, 95% of my days, I was the only woman in the room. So you just have to. I've definitely, you know, had times where I, I was more timid than I would have liked to or someone you know, I would say something, it didn't resonate, and then a man would say it five seconds later, and then it resonated. And so there, I've definitely experienced that. And I've never experienced proactive, like, bias against me or anyone, you know, saying I couldn't do something. But it really is that, that women are trained from birth to be nice and not make ways to serve the community and not self. And it's just, it's, it's too much to expect the woman herself to carry that entire burden of all the societal training we've got and our first breath and take it upon herself to just get over it. Mm, yeah. so what we need is leaders who really are thoughtful about that. Eric, who I worked for for nine years at Google um, as CEO and as executive chairman, he um, was very good at calling on the quiet people in the room because he said those are the people who don't just want to hear themselves talk. They've actually been thoughtful and contemplative. And so he actively Told, and it terrifies people when they haven't been in a room with him before because it's often the junior most person who's just sitting there respectfully and he'll be like, what do you think? And one is because he, he knows that there's this self filter that happens and, and um, he also knows from experience that um, calling on underrepresented voices changes the conversation. Often if you call on the junior most person in the room, they have beautiful novice perspective which is why he, Larry and Sergey, designed Google to be a system with really clear direction from the top, but bottom up innovation. Like our best ideas come from our interns, people who are brand new from there because they don't carry this burden of the way that things have always been done. They don't know what they can't do yet. And so they come at things in really creative ways. And so Eric is very proactive in calling on people. And I try and do that now as I'm in positions of leadership, I'm on boards of directors, board of advisors. I try and replicate that, pull out, underrepresented voices in the room. Often that's me helping women, but I, I think it's important for us to realize that this, this is a burden that people aren't even aware of in themselves. And mm -hmm. so to expect a woman to just get over it is kind of, is putting an additional burden on her. So if we can all help each other and recognize when someone maybe isn't being um, recognized for what they can offer in a situation or a job, then that would be great. But yeah, there is some self selection issues, like you're not going to apply for a job as a woman that you don't feel 100% qualified for. And I'm hoping as people hear about me, like, like my story is, in my opinion, I am unexceptional in the story. The cast of characters around me were exceptional. I want everyone to know that like there wasn't anything particularly unusual or unattainable about me or my skills. Anybody can do this. And so I hope that hearing like how I put myself out there and I didn't die or it was well received or, you know, even when I did crash and burn, like I got over it, hopefully inspire someone else to also be brave and to do those things. I actually um, am working on my first book. Um, I have a, a two book deal with HarperCollins Leadership. And my whole first book is about that. It's about um, making exceptional opportunities for yourself when your options seem limited. How do you create doorways when maybe you've got this entry level job? My, my entry level job at Amazon could have been nothing, but I pushed it. I redefined what it was and it's easy, actionable risk taking that I feel like anybody can learn. It's not mm -hmm. special to me. I really don't think so. Uh, what's, the, what's the title of the book going to be? Do you know yet? It's a working, I, I don't know what the final one will be. I, I actually submitted five title options to my publisher just yesterday. But at the moment, my working title is Say Your Name. There's a lot, of, and it goes to the point you were just making, is we need to stand up for ourselves and, and raise your hand for something you're not yet ready to do. 
be, um, I talk a lot about mindset. Carol Dweck, a brilliant Stanford professor, she talks a lot about mind, um, mindset. And my version of, of her great um, academic work around that is what I really want people to do is to shift from a performance mindset where the goal is to get 100 out of 100 every time. I am a massive perfectionist by nature. My poor artist mother, you know, when I would join her art classes after school and I was stressed and it was just such a beautiful thing to be able to do. She had this studio in her house and I would go down there, but I had this massive problem with a blank canvas. If I was starting a new project, I would sit there for days and not touch it because I didn't want to do something that I couldn't come back from. And so my mom learned to just come by with her brush and just go across my campus, canvas. And once I, there was something on my canvas, I'd be like, I can make something out of that. And I got inspired. And that's kind of my personality. Like I'm happy cleaning up someone else's mess or making organ, organized systems out of someone else's vision. So to do it for myself is still remains hard for me. Um, but if you can shift from a performance mindset where you're defined by perfection and you can move into a learning mindset where the goal is, how can I learn as much as possible? I'm not going to be a hundred out of a hundred for me to learn as much as possible. That that's going to really push me. So maybe I'm going to get 60 out of a hundred, but look what the learning I get in, right. in, um, in return. And Adam Grant, who is an amazing um, behavioral psychologist who studies the future of work, said this better than I could in a New York times op-ed where he said, wouldn't it be amazing if we thought about university in that way, if you weren't looking for the perfect 4.0, the perfect hundred out of hundred, but you took a class, that you knew you weren't going to be good at because you wanted to learn as much as possible. Wouldn't we have a completely different academic experience? Absolutely. I want to take Chinese because that sounds awesome. I want to learn different tonalities in a language I've never experienced before. I want to take, you know, Steve Jobs' famous example of he took a calligraphy class and that changed. That's the reason we have fonts in our computers right so, now. So, like, think about the, so think about the difference, Anne, in, in innova innovation and things that, that you know, they would occur if many of us had a, a part of their life that they spent doing things they didn't know anything about, right? That they, they just dive into and do things that not worried about the, the 100 out of 100, as you said, and just doing something that, that new and just know they're going to fail, 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 fail. But think about the things that come out of that when somebody new with new eyes is doing something and the innovation that occurs when that happens, right? I mean, my, my best, the best stuff that I've ever, you know, thought of that have propelled my businesses or myself has been, Things that when I've done things I'm not good at, I got thrown into. Right? Um, you know, we we battled the unions in a Chicago market at one point that you know really was tough on my my, my family, my business, and all that. But I learned so much about labor law. I would have never went to you know, I would have never went to school for labor law and learned the, the stuff I learned um, that was forced on me. Right? I had to read everything I could just to kind of continue to fight them. And and again, that was actually looking back a great experience for the rest of my life that I. That, that I enjoy understanding a little more about than most people in my, in my space. So again, I, I, I just think that, and I, I became a little more creative to, to fight the, 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 the labor law that I was up against. And, and I, I learned a lot and we, we had some cases that are, that are known, that are, that are cases that are known today under our name. Um, Cause we thought differently. And, and again, yeah. and people, people use our experience for back then uh, for their own. So, so if, if everybody could have that mindset, maybe not 100% of life could be that, right? You have to get great at things and you want to be a champion at things. Um, and, and it's easier to be great at things you're very passionate about. So, but, to, but to challenge ourselves to do some things maybe we're not passionate about, to learn something new. And, and, and then our, our mind works creatively, I think, and, and much more innovatively when we do that. And we dive into something we're not familiar with. And we ask more questions of why, right? Um, so that's, that's interesting. I, you've just articulated exactly what makes these great CEOs great and innovative. It's exactly that. They live none, no part of their day is in their comfort zone. And that's a challenge for me and my job uh, for Eric Schmidt, for example, as his chief of staff. My job was to push him, to make him like, have, so he's constantly uncomfortable. He's never living in that comfort zone. We're always trying to break the model and, and find new ways to do it. The only reason I could be successful is that. Um, is so yes, I worked for Jeff and I had experienced that level of CEO ingenuity and greatness before. But after Amazon, I actually left to do a PhD at Berkeley. And in that environment, I was terrified, honestly, because I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't, it wasn't what I expected. A PhD program is, is weird. You read a, a, my first quarter, I literally stacked up the books on the floor and it was taller than me. They were in four different languages. 
And I was expected to read a volume of material I'd never done before. And then class was literally sitting in a room. There were only three of us in my program. And we just talked for four hours. Like there was no, I was like, how do you grade me? And that yeah. I had to learn. That was a big shift for me out of this performance mindset into a learning mindset. We were there digesting this massive amount of information. And the goal is just talk it out until we got to an original thought. And it took me so long to get comfortable doing that and being in that space. And I had no idea that it was actually preparing me to be successful at Google, who then recruited me a few years into my program. I could not have been successful sitting. Look, I professionally have been the dumbest person in the room for the last 12 years. Not because I'm dumb. I am not. But because of the room I sat in. I at the table with like Nobel Prize winners and celebrities and heads of state. And I had to be comfortable being... I, uh, Eric had me at that table because he knew I had that novice. Like we, he purposely also made himself a novice at every table. We would speak out Nobel Absolutely. Prize winners in fields we couldn't even pronounce. And we would sit there and just ask the dumb questions. And that would always bring a new insight. Um, when you get the, that level of expertise there and you can hone in on something new, that's when innovation happens. Awesome. And, and again, you know, do you miss anything now that you get a PhD, right? For me, I'm still the dummy in every room because I have no, no real education beyond high school, right? No. So, so I still walk in every meeting I'm in and I know I'm the dumbest in the room ac academically, right? But, yeah. but I warn people of that and I ask dumb questions that give me answers that hopefully make me a little smarter. And, and again, so well, what I do find is I have friends who are really highly educated and, and sometimes they, they, they think they know more than they know and they don't, they don't know what they don't know, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think that's, it comes as a deficit sometimes when somebody is educated so well at a young age and they, they've, they've spent their life in labor educating, right, to be so doggone smart in the things that they've learned so much about. Sometimes they, they, they don't ever, you know, they, they get into a real life situation of leadership and they, they're embarrassed to ask a dumb question, right, or a question they think is yeah. dumb. And so did you lose some of that but with that PhD or did you, did you continue to say, I'm still going to be that the, the inquisitive, objective mind that doesn't know it all? Um, my PhD was tough. I, it, it was really hard. Honestly, it took me a good year to get into it. I was just getting, getting into the groove of it when Google started recruiting. Um, right. Actually, I was in lockdown with my parents in Seattle um, during this COVID outbreak. I'd been in the States to speak at a conference got stuck. I live in Spain now. Spain closed its borders and I was home with my parents for a long time. And my dad literally, we were talking about, I mean, he's seen me do press interviews and um, consulting my clients and all this like high level stuff. And he literally one night we were talking about school and I, I have an, a sister who's just finishing her undergrad and is thinking about a master's. And my dad um, turns to me and he's like, oh, I really wish you'd finished your PhD. And I, he didn't mean to hurt my feelings, but it really hurt my feelings because I thought like, he thinks my career was a mistake. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and that's not what he meant by it at all. I think it was just like that value for him. It's, you know, it's another level of accomplishment of like his sacrifice, taking those big risks is, you know, you have a paper to show for it. And I just immediately defend, I was like, do you know if I'd stayed in my PhD, like nobody would have read what I wrote, like two people. Now I've presented my ideas to heads of state and celebrities, like the impact is immeasurable of what yeah. we've done. But I think his point was that of like, you get the value of learning for learning is something that's so prized in my family. Absolutely. Um, so I want to preserve that. And I want to live in that space where you're constantly curious and hungry and you don't think all your ideas are good. So to answer your question, it's like, it's a balance of the two. I think you have to have a level of like confidence to, in order to get to that point of humility where you can invite that level of criticism. Mm -hmm. Jeff Bezos, sure. um, well, Jeff and Eric, my two major CEOs that I've worked for, both went to Princeton and both were exceptionally bright from like birth. They're just gifted people. Mm -hmm. Eric went to Princeton very young. He graduated from high school very early. He doesn't really talk about that much, but he was very young in this academic environment where while he was the smartest kid in the class, he wasn't necessarily like invited to anything because he was a kid. Um, so they, they both came from these while they were exceptionally bright, Jeff grew up on a farm in his grandpa's ranch in Texas. Um, Eric was just had to be scrappy from a very young age to fit in. And they both never lost that. They just always felt like you had to like claw their way into respect and, and fitting in and, and being in with the cool kids. And that's this beautiful side of them is like, they know they, they're exceptionally bright. Um, like for example, Eric, while he's CEO at Google, or even before Google, when he was realized his life was going to be a CEO and he was going to live on a plane, 
he decided that if he was going to live his life on a plane, he wanted to do the fun part, which was fly it. So he became a fully certified commercial air pilot so he could fly his own jet. <laughs> that, him being able to do as a hobby what other people spend their entire life dedicated to, is nobody else can do that. That's just, yeah. um, that's the level of like quickness. Like he, he can just, you know, he has to do all the regular certifications that professional pilots do, and he will just cram massive amounts of information before he does each of those recertifications. So awesome. there, there are people who live comfortably in that space, and there's something just so, I'm so grateful. The rest of my life has changed for witnessing people who surround themselves with people. Not only do they expect people to be exceptionally bright, they expect them to push back. Jeff had a, um, at Amazon, he had a role then called the shadow. It has a more official name now that I don't remember. And the shadow position he created because it, it is lonely at the top. Nobody knows everything. And he needed a peer to bounce ideas off of. He wanted that, you know, academic style peer review. So my first year at Amazon, Jeff's shadow was Andy Jaffe. Andy Jaffe now is the CEO of, um, oh gosh, I just forgot what my brain was called. Uh, I want to say A9, but that's their search company out of, um, what is it called? Oh, Amazon Web Services. So Andy Jesse is now the C, uh, CEO of AWS, Amazon Web Service, Services, which is the platform upon which all startups are built now. It changed the world. But when Andy came in, he knew nothing. He was just a young, promising, really exceptionally bright person that Jeff wanted to train. He wanted to train him to think like he did, ask the questions he would ask, like what he likes, hate what he hates. And he basically cloned himself in the body of Andy Jassy. And so Andy then went on to do greatness. Now that takes a very humble person because Andy's job description was to push back on Jeff, to read everything that he read, sit in every meeting and to be there to be the devil's advocate, to push him. Have we thought about that enough? How should we analyze this? Maybe we should pay attention to that guy. And Eric constantly did that. I mean, he, he refused to be with people who told him all, all of his ideas were good and all his jokes were funny. He awesome. Just that challenge. Yeah. yeah. So, so we try to do that. I mean, we push that for the same exact result. I mean, I want all our leaders and, and to be to expect to be challenged on a daily basis. We have core values that we believe in. We'll drive. We'll continue to drive our business to success. And and if and we if we're living outside those core values, we want to be challenged, right? If there, if we have an idea that we're gonna we're gonna execute on, we want everybody in the room to challenge the heck out of it, right? And, and you get the best out of people that way. If you're in, and if, the, if your culture is that, that, that recognizes this is what you reward, right, then you'll get it. If you can, you can talk about it, and, and, and early on I talked about it a lot, but I didn't reward anybody or, or you know, pat them on the back even when they challenge. I was like thrown back for a minute, and I'd think, oh, oh, I guess that was a good, you know, good question. Thank you, right? And, but it, but it, it took a while before you, I embraced it or anybody really embraced that culture. But now that you know, we, we definitely have that in our, our organizations, and it's so much more fun when any, a person first day on the job is welcome to challenge and welcome to question anything around them. Uh, and it's still tough to, to, for somebody new to, to, to buy into that culture right away. They're still afraid for a while. So you just have to make it so acceptable and actually pat people on the back and reward them if, they, if, if, they, if they're good at it, right, if they like doing it. And you're going to do it in a, in a way that's, not, that's respectful and all that, but that, that happens, right? That, that's natural to most people. Of course. But, but, but again, to, you know, to talk about that, I mean, I, I, I mean any great organization I, I feel like has that. Um, and very seldom you see a successful organization where there's one person at the top and there's a couple below them and they are, you know, that you're there to serve them, right? That, that's exactly. today's, today's environment, today's culture and, you know, the millennial generation today, it doesn't, doesn't fly in my opinion, right? You better be that bottom up, you know, that CEO and those leaders better be at the bottom serving everybody above, however big above is, right? And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, our, our, our American entrepreneurial culture is so much better today for that mindset. Because, you know, as, as you know, your dad would tell you, you're too young to remember. But, man, it was you're the CEO. They're there to serve you, right? I, I've gotten to be the executive VP, and now these people work for me, right? Uh, we, right? we want the mindset to be, sorry, man, now that you're this CEO or president, now you're there to serve everybody. You better be there to answer every phone call, to, to respond to everybody that's there to serve you. And it's not just your teammates, right? It's your customers, it's your vendors. And, and that makes a great CEO, right? So, I so couldn't you, agree more. You've seen it. You've seen it from one of the, the best organizations that are in our world's history, which is, yeah. is so cool, right? You've seen this at the, at the highest level, at, the, at one of the coolest organizations ever, ever built in our, in our world's history. 
which is uh, yeah. amazing to I think about. Yeah, that's not an understatement. It's kind of very no, humbling. It's been there it's, foundational parts of, of these companies' journey. Yeah. So yeah. So so, uh, so now, what are you what are you doing now with your time today or nowadays? I mean, you're uh, you, you're you're serving on some boards. Can you tell us about what you're doing that yes. you're really excited about? Yeah. So I left Google a year and a half ago. I moved to Spain. So that's dramatic cultural whiplash going from the heart of Silicon Valley, the ultimate, you know, in terms of pace and ambition. And now I live on the Mediterranean coast in Spain. Um, what, what made you choose Spain? What was, tell us about that. <laughs> I, fell in love with, I fell in love with the Spaniard is the short version of that. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> so beware if you come on a vacation to Spain, you might meet a handsome guy your first night here and turn your whole life upside down. Which is what happened to me. <laughs> really? Uh, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now, um, so I decided after I left Google, I've been there for 12 years and I thought, right, I haven't had a pause um, since I graduated from undergrad. So I haven't really taken a breath since 2002. So I, I purposely wanted to like, wait and give myself six months to see what resonates what my goals are. I really wanted to take this as an opportunity to springboard into something, not just like laterally. I wanted, I wanted a rocket ship. And so I considered other things at Google, like in the London office with the DeepMind team, our AI division, or in the Madrid office. And it just didn't feel like the right, it didn't feel like a springboard. Um, and so then um, quite accidentally, I didn't keep my promise to myself. Um, and I started consulting because when I worked for Eric, he had a personal VC company called Innovation Endeavors. And um, over the years, as he invested in young startups and CEOs, he would say, oh, you know, this, this CEO is really struggling with this. Could you have coffee with him? Or this other CEO has questions about this. Could you just meet with her? And, and so I just started chatting with these people casually because he's like, you've seen it all. You can just really, like in five minutes, like help them walk through this. Um, and so I did. It was just fun. And then when I left, when people heard I was gone, they're like, would love more of your time. Like it, it was just so helpful because that's what I've done for 15 years. It's been that like thinking partner, that analytical partner to get the, C- the CEOs to the answers, not because I knew them, but just like talking through it. And I knew what, what questions to ask. I could get them to some results. So then it just, I thought, Oh, this will be fun. So I started taking on projects and now suddenly I have a consulting company and with clients all over the world. Um, in like, I don't even know how six, seven different countries across, three continents and it's just kind of taken off. So I don't know, since I kind of built it, I didn't build that purposely. Um, I still consider myself in experimental phase. So right now it's been a great education because um, they're CEOs in very different industries, different growth stages and have different challenges. And I'm learning about how the Silicon Valley model for innovation, growth at scale, et cetera, does and doesn't apply in the European market. Most of my clients are in the UK. Um, and so that's been a great challenge to me is how can I repackage these skills, my instincts, these lessons I've learned to help out entrepreneurs here. I would really love to stop seeing so much brain drain from Europe. I'd love for them to be able to build these corporations, get their startups off the ground here instead of having to go to the States to get that level of funding, to get that traction, Mm -hmm. because in the States it is very different. It is much easier to be an entrepreneur there. And so I'm trying to get involved in some government, um, proactive programs to build better insurance for entrepreneurs here in Europe. And um, yeah, I've got a couple of exciting things on the horizon. I haven't fully taken shape, but I've, I've been feeling some moonshot opportunities are just around the corner. You absolutely, you're going to have amazing moonshot opportunities with your, with your, your mind and your experience and in your youth, you've got so much opportunity. It's unbelievable. I love that you so keep much. calling me youth. I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to call you're, you. You're a kid, darn God. For, you know, I, I look, I feel like I'm a kid and I'm, I'm, I'm an old guy now, 50, I just turned 57, right? And, uh, and I've got so much more, you know, in, in my tank and I'm going to have a blast doing a lot of things just for my, yeah. my, my experiences, my hillbilly experiences, not, not my, uh, you know, amazing experiences that, that you have. So you're, you're going to be such a, a blessing to so many people. It's going to be a blast. Actually, I, I would love to know more about that. I mean, another call that, to understand what you're doing, because I, I am in front of a lot of different CEOs and startups and I'm, I'm invested in a bunch of different startups that some, some with, that I think are. Um, amazing opportunities for to change change our world and and some uh, just little friends friends of mine start something and I invest with them but but it's so much fun to do that yeah. and and I, I I think there's 
I definitely have some ideas of some some businesses that you would be amazing, amazing board member if you do, you're doing that and, and stuff like that. I know you're you're yeah. only going to be able to so much on your plate, um, and you're going to your demand is going to be. I know. Every time I travel, you know, pre-crisis when I was traveling constantly, because like let's be real, like a girl from Silicon Valley moving to small town Spain, like I I <laughs> I can't just stay here. So normally I'm on the road half the time, and I get that stimulus from that. But every time I come back from a trip, my poor husband is like, what did you say yes to this time? Because I just, <laughs> it's so interesting and I don't want to say no to like a really complex problem. And the poor guy, he's like, you need, you need to hire an assistant who will say no for, for you. Tell, hey, tell, tell us about this lucky Spaniard now. Where, where, where does he do? And, uh, and, and tell us a little bit about him, if you, if you would. Yeah. Yeah, he's, um, he is very different from me and very similar um, in, in other ways. So he is um, an architect, or sorry, an agricultural engineer. And so he did, has got his master's degree in agricultural engineering, and he does landscape design. So he designs private um, gardens, vineyards for these big villas that we have here on the coast of Spain. And so he spends, half, well, pre-crisis, he would spend half of his day on his computer doing all the soil sample analysis and all the research and drafting things out and making these big design proposals. And then his second company was the maintenance side of the company, which he's just in the process of selling. He has two more weeks in that transition. But yeah, this maintenance part of it, which would do all the implementation, the planting, and and he just makes things beautiful for a living, which I just think is the greatest yeah. job ever. And he loves it. The man is a self-proclaimed president of the 5 a.m. club because he just springs out of bed and every day and I just think that's great energy to be around except at 5 a.m. when I don't want to hear it and I just want to sleep for another hour I prefer to wake up at 7 or 5 <laughs> it never happens anymore um but to be around that kind of energy and I I liked him when we first met while our lives are pretty different I liked him because he he owned two companies he was invested in several companies he's lived abroad he's he speaks English perfectly, and um, he lived in London, um, in France, in Portugal. He studied in each of those places, so he's very international. And that none of his friends here are like he's also a massive anomaly in, in his network. Most most of his friends here have very traditional jobs, have never left Spain, don't speak any other languages. In fact, they only speak in the regional dialect, which is Salampiano. Wow. So when I'm with him and his friends, I'm now one of the main reasons I wanted to come to Spain was. Um, he speaks the language of my heart. I should speak the language of his. So I'm getting there with my Spanish. But it's really hard because all I hear is Valenciano around me. So yeah. now I, I'm finally at the point where I understand it. But um, I, I just speak to them back in Spanish. But so, um, so, yeah, yeah. He's the oldest of two kids. His parents were also really um, a big part of that unusual foundation that he had. His dad's a doctor, a physician, and his mom's a history professor. And so they just had that expectation of being doing something bigger than yourself, serving your community, um, you know, using your abilities to the best of your power to make the world around you better. And his, his brothers took that on as well. His brother's six years younger than him, um, and he's a, an attorney in Valencia. So great family. Yeah. Awesome. That's so awesome. And, and what you saw in him was that passion, right? I mean, yeah. popping out of bed at five in the morning because he's so excited about life and what he's doing yep. today and tomorrow, right? Uh, and that's uh, that's so cool, and and our Elvis yeah. should be like that, right? That's who you want to yeah. be like, and that's who you want to be around, right? So it's so so awesome. So you know what? Uh, my my son-in-law, my daughter, my son-in-law, his family's from a um, a little town in Italy, uh, near the west yeah. coast of Italy, and you know, like maybe a couple hours above Naples over there. And, and he's, he keeps showing me these this uh, this uh, this vineyard there that's for sale. It's like a it's like 80 or 100 acre vineyard and it's it's on the, the side of the mountain and stuff that overlooks the, that the, uh, the the ocean oh, it's so so beautiful it's really good and it's really inexpensive as you might know right uh, might be a good next project huh it's so inexpensive and he's like come on come on you know gary we we should you know get a few people together and, and do this and you know, it'd be amazing and we have a place to go and I'm, I'm a dual citizen there now you know you've got somehow he's got dual citizenship and and because uh, his family is all from Siena, Siena, Italy, and actually my granddaughter was they named her Siena um, for oh. after that town that, that his family's from. And uh, anyway, so it's it's I, I, my wife and I've been to Italy um, and uh, love it. My daughter was there for just for a semester in, in school, and then we went there for for a trip around Italy. Such an awesome, beautiful country. But when when you look, okay, we'll go back to it. When you look at Spain and and, and and Europe and stuff, and you see the challenges for free enterprise, I mean. I, 
what are you going to do about that, girl? I know you got some ideas here. I, 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 I studied this a little bit, right? I, I'm so blessed, and I didn't really, I wasn't worldly at all. Never traveled outside hardly Illinois until I was in my, let's say, 30s, and I, and I started to make you know some some good good money. My wife and I started traveling a lot, and I've been all over the world since. And uh, so I, when I look when I'm around the world, I look at pavements, and I, I study pavements, which in Spain and Italy and all this, you have some of the oldest pavements in the world, which is cool for me to look at. Absolutely. But then also, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a crazy entrepreneur that loves free enterprise and loves our country for, for that, right? And I, and I see the issues that, in these other countries and the barriers to be, to be entrepreneur on the risk to do it, right? When there's just the re- reward isn't as big as it is in America as you're taxed yeah. more and stuff. So what, what are you going to do about this, girl? Let me hear about that. <laughs> I'm working on it. It's, it's a tough problem to solve. I feel like I started this project while I was still with Eric. Because when you transition from being CEO of Google to being chairman, we kept the two thirds of that job that was externally facing. So that was policy was a lot of the way we spent our time and communication, doing speeches and educating the public about evolving technologies. Um, So the policy side was where we got to meet with all heads of state all over the world. I think in, in the last few years I was with Eric, we went to 35 plus countries and met with world leaders about exactly that. How can you prepare an environment that encourages and enables entrepreneurism? How do you prevent brain drain? How do you, um, what are the challenges being faced by entrepreneurs? Because Google firmly believes, and Eric and I personally, as a huge part of our personal values, believes that the world is best served when there's more competition, when there's great minds thinking about great problems and coming together with new perspectives, the more diversity, the better. And so we really wanted to encourage, a, a, we wanted to encourage government systems that would support that environment. So we talked about several things, but I think some of the main things that stick in my mind are, first, it's it's a cultural issue. So in more traditional communities where, for example, here in Spain, you're kind of expected to have the same job as your father. It's passed down to you like your birthright. Mm -hmm. Um, And the fact that my husband did not become a doctor like his father was an enormous disappointment. Mm -hmm. And it took a lot of talking to, um, to change his university studies to do that and to follow his passion. Um, and so there's that. There's a, there's a, also the other cultural side of it is the lower tolerance for risk, for doing something that nobody's done before, taking a risk. You see that in Japan, for example. Japan is very innovative, but you don't, it has to be community minded. It can't be about the individual, which I think is one of the most beautiful and challenging parts of their culture in terms of business sure. and industry. Um, and then, second, you don't have the same government support. And this is for me, if I was, um, in a position of power here in Europe and with a policymaker, I would be focusing on this first because higher education is going to be the key of being an innovative, thriving economy of the future because everything is going to be interwoven with artificial intelligence. And that means you need a very high proportion of your people with PhD level education. It cannot be a side project. It has to be a top focus, which requires like getting them ready from kindergarten up, like creating pipelines for that, creating funding, having tax incentive structures around that. Um, this, I'm speaking to you, U.S., this is how we lose our position as a dominant, innovative con- country if we don't focus on our education system. This is why China's five years ahead of us in AI, and in AI years, that's decades. So that's yeah. unacceptable. Um, so we need, we need investment in higher, higher education. And then third is, uh, is about funding. So you, a lot of the brain drain from Europe really comes down to funding because there's such a low tolerance for risk here, and, and people only invest a small amount of money. So you get people who are giving you their entire nest egg, but that's only a couple hundred grand, and you don't have runway enough. Here in Europe, you have to have proof of concept before someone will even give you money. And if you go to um, you know, Sand Hill Road in Silicon Valley, they'll give you a couple million just on the idea. And it's just vastly different opportunities, different sure. runway structures, different burn rates. Um, and so for me, if I was to oversimplify the differences at the moment, it would be those three categories. I would sure. love to see that change. Sure, sure. No, I, I, I align with you perfectly on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on everything there. And the thing I haven't heard is the, is the other, you must have more PhD educations come out of that, out, out of your, out of your country, right? Um, tell me about that. So, so we, we have one of our businesses that, that's, uh, you know, that's, do, has, that needs AI, that we, we have some AI going on within it, but we, it really needs to be driven exclusively by EI, uh, uh, EI, AI, when it comes to uh, when it comes to long term uh, of this business, and when I say this, 
right now, it, it's, it's leading that space. And there's a startup that my son and, and uh, Robbie is part of, who's, who's on with us. Um, and this business will be, uh, right now it's leading in the industry of facilities assessments in the country. And now we're getting into utility assessments, you know, easement assessments and, and, and uh, cell towers and wind farms and solar farms. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is basically using drones and satellite imagery to assess the condition of, of uh, assets, right? Um, very big, we're very big in the facility space in a, in a short period of time. This, this uh, business was started about four or five years ago with him as an incubator within one of our businesses. My son's idea, my son spun it out into another company. He was a CEO of until recently became a CEO of all of our companies. But, so we're actually looking for a CEO for this company now. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to triple in size, maybe go, grow 10 times its size this year. At least triple, but maybe 10 times growth this year. Cool. We're, we're trying to find a CEO, but basically... We know that you know right now it's engineers doing most of this work, most of the identification of condition of properties, let's say pavements and roofs and everything around a building or anything around a facility. But but we're we're training AI, but we're slow and we're not doing it we're not doing it efficiently yet. We have to invest big in AI coming going forward. What what do you I mean? Do you, do you just go to a Chinese company and say you know help build this with us? What you know what do you what do you do? Do you trust that as a partner in your in just in a, just in a in a general general mindset of knowing what we're going for, because it really this this product should be a SaaS product, and eventually, mm -hmm. right? It shouldn't be yeah. you know a, a job by job product where we got all these eyes looking at you know thousands and thousands of, of uh, images. So in your eyes, not scalable, mm -hmm. right? It's not scalable. So you're in your mind, and just from the top looking at what, you know, where do you think you go to grab that AI uh, um, uh, the AI team, the, the AI intel that you need. Well, um, I would snag someone straight out of university if you can, because there is now a pipeline coming, but it's not enough for the demand. So out of that, you see what I would look for is right now there's these um, companies that are doing automation of the AI implementation. And so that way you can have, hopefully they're, they're still working on this. In fact, I'm, I was consulting for a company that's doing this very thing where they're, they're creating an automated system where it's kind of like your Salesforce and you just plug into that network and it can insert the AI where it needs to be in your individual company. Because right now what's not scalable is there aren't enough AI experts in the world because it's so it's brand new breakthrough, like just kids in their basements right now are inventing yeah. it, right? So like it's not, they're not in the workforce yet. There's just not enough for every company that needs an AI expert. There isn't enough to go around. So they're having to build themselves out of a job and find, build these systems where you can just do plug and play AI um, technologies. Cause you're right. I mean, I mean, it was at least five plus years ago that I was saying um, to companies, if you don't, no matter your industry, if you don't realize you're a technology company, you're already dead. And now in this crisis right now, we've seen that that's come true. If you're you exactly right. Digital platform, it's over. And I'm telling you now AI, I think five years from now, if you haven't already figured out how to automate that, like you're saying, you're not scalable, so you won't be competitive. So right. that's why these companies are popping up now to help people because they're just there isn't enough places to go for industry experts. Sure. Yeah, we we have a um, we have a, a gentleman that said he'd he'd love to be on the board of this business. He's he's a uh, a professor at, at University of Texas, and he and he's oh, in charge of all technology, AI, and everything. And he, he loves the concept, so he'd love to be part of it. So we just got to get that going. But he, I, I think he'd probably be a big help in identifying our yeah. needs forward and talent, probably right. So that's kind of what we have to look into. So yeah, that's, so it's so much fun. But 100 percent, every business we we have, and we're, we're, it's fun for us because we're in kind of dirty businesses that aren't that exciting for 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 young people coming out of school. Not many people say I want to I want to pave asphalt and pour concrete. You know, as they they work hard for their degrees in, in physics or uh, you know neuroscience or <laughs> so. So either way, bottom line is. We, we, we have fun because we, we do invest a lot in technology and, and, and in our space, it's not that common. So we're, our, our industry is fur, further behind when it comes to investing in technology. So we, we, anything we do with technology and we do a lot with it, it's, it gives us a leg up on our competitors pretty fast. And that won't be the case always. If we're complacent, right, that's not going to be the case in the long, in the long run. But we're very confident that you know, we, we're going to continue to stay ahead of the, the competitions, keep swimming off that blue ocean away from the red shark infested waters, right? So okay. you know, also, also one more thing, you know, uh, uh, are you, are you, have you been involved in um, uh, Abundance 360 at all with uh, Peter no. Diamandis? I know, you know Peter, but no, I haven't been involved. Uh -uh. 
So, so I've been, I, I joined that a couple of years ago, and that, that's so much fun. His conference is amazing. He's got some amazing bright minds that, that show up, and you know, I sponge off everybody I can. And, and he basically interviews, he's got like 360 CEOs that are part of it. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to be one of those. And it's so much fun to, uh, to be amongst these crazy, fun entrepreneurs that are always thinking, how do we use technology forward in a better way? But, but yeah, so a lot, a lot, you know, he's, he's part of the XPRIZE thing and all that, right? Yep. Um, he's quite, he's quite, a, he's quite a, a unique individual, isn't he? He's quite a character. Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> I used to talk to him all the time when, at yeah. Google. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah, he's really neat. Um, so yeah, so, so again, I, I would, I mean, my, my recommendation to anybody, I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you have a dry cleaning shop. I don't care if you're in grocery business. I don't care if you're in construction or whatever. Right. And, and I think those businesses are better served, even if you're diving into technology faster because your competition probably isn't compared to, you know, health, health and, uh, uh, and normal technology businesses, right. Are, are, have to be constantly focused and, and it's tough to keep up. You know, I mean, I can't imagine, you know, Google and, and, and uh, Amazon and, and, and those companies and what it looks like. I mean, it's all technology and it's got to be so much fun. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so again, so, the, so in, the, in the next five years, you're going to be building this consulting business. And, and uh, are you going to hire people someday to, to be, uh, you know, mini ants like. Uh, I as, sure hope so. <laughs> as, as, I, need, as, I need all the help I can get. I have big, big dreams. I just had a call with a friend. Um, in Barcelona with just yesterday about some moonshot ideas that we have. So I'm going to quickly need a lot of help because we've got some really big, big things we're, we're dreaming up. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. So, so Ian, a lot of our listeners probably don't, I mean, I've heard the moonshot through, you know, the abundance 360 and Peter and I, in that group. I hear it all the time when we think about it all the time. So I've never, I never talked about it much on my, on my podcast. Can you, can you explain mm-hmm. that mentality, that mindset, the moonshot mindset that you have and why? Yeah, what I really should do right now is plagiarize the article just published by that friend I mentioned, Pablo, in, um, in Barcelona, because he was the CEO of Tele- Telefonica, which is the big comms company here in Spain. They had a company called Alpha, and they built um, Telefonica Alpha based on Google X. X is our moonshot factory at Google, where, as you know, when we, um, re- when we reorganized the company to separate Google from the dream, which is why it became Alphabet. X is the dreaming stage. So the short of it is moonshots are something, it's a goal you set for yourself that you're going to attain, but you cannot do that in the next six to 10 years at least. It's, it's so big that you can't wrap your head around it right now. Um, it's something that no one has ever done before. No one knows what success looks like. And you're just going to go in to see how much you can learn and how close you can get to that goal. We should just scratch everything I just said, and I should just read out loud the paper that you just published. No, no, no. You're, you're doing all, you're explaining awesome. I literally want to pull it up on my screen right now because it was just – I. that's why we reconnected yesterday because I sent him a message being like, this is the single best explanation of moonshots I've ever heard. Um, so I'm trying to remember what he, how he put it. But it's really – it's doing something no one's ever done before, unapologetically, putting all your resources into it, and it's kind of that unicorn mentality. When, it, when a um, – when a VC firm invests in something, they're looking for unicorns, which is giving you a hundred X return when all the other 99 are, are not going to pay out. So it takes a very long-term vision. It takes a high tolerance for risk and failure because that's 100% the formula for how you're going to get there. It's by the end of it, it's not going to be resemble the original vision you set out for yourself. So I used to spend one day a week, um, my last nine years at Google, sitting with the Google X team because that's where we held our senior executive staff meetings and our board meetings within their building. And I just watched this crazy process of the smartest people in the world just kicking it around and trying things. They would have parties to celebrate failures, not because we wanted to fail or waste a lot of money, but because they would celebrate the learning. Astro That's Teller, who's, a, who's the head of, of X, would stand up there and dissect, what did we learn? How, do, how can we implement that into all these other projects? How can we share this learning across these different, these different tests? And, um, that I think is key, but a part that nobody else talks about, and I think we need to recognize, is another important thing that happens at Google in this innovative culture is not only do we do what at Google we call the post-mortem reports, like why did this die, what was the critical failure, but we also would take that critical eye when something worked, because we were inventing things no one had ever done before, and sometimes we'd put it out there and be like, oh, I can't believe that stuck. I can't believe that worked. It's so crazy, and then you'd have to analyze. You miss all the lessons learned if you don't analyze, like, 
what was different about it that time? What were the key components of, of success? How can we cross pollinate that across all the projects we have going on at the company? So I feel like personally, I want to do that for myself. When something works, when I, I perform better than I thought or something really resonates or I try a project and it goes well, spend some time dissecting that instead of just, you know, we're so hypercritical. You know, if you get 99 positive comments on something you did and you get one negative, you can recite word for word that one negative comment. Right? <laughs> we're, we're just DNA. Like it's something in us that we're programmed to focus on the negative. But if you can focus on the positive, what you're doing well, how you can re cross pollinate that across what you're trying to accomplish you just have such an advantage. So for me, that's a big part of the moonshot culture is celebrating the learning, high tolerance for failure because we're not going for 100 out of 100, we're going for maximizing learning and creating, for me, the, the third really, really important component about why this is difficult to replicate is you need um, the smartest people in the world who are also collaborators at an Olympic level. Like they don't mind peer review. They're not out for individual glory. They're really mission and passion driven. And they're not just looking at the ego. And that's when you get out of that performance mindset and you can, you can be in that space. So I, I recognized after I, I left Google um, how, <laughs> that I'm not in Oz anymore. Like there's brilliant entrepreneurs everywhere. But to find that collective concentration of those kind of people in one place was the greatest privilege of my life. I, I miss that a lot. People are always like, oh, do you miss the private jet? And you do, you miss no, I miss the people. I really just miss those guys. I mean, all their quirky yeah. and all their like social awkwardness. Like I just, I miss that kind of like. Oh my, yeah, how much, that, that, that's had to be so awesome, right? To, to see all these different personalities and what you realize is, you know, it, it never happens one person. It, it, you know, success doesn't happen from one person, right? I mean, it happens from all different all different paradigms together, thinking on their own and being objective and opening up their minds to, to criticize and, and 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 to be you know can, can, uh, can have have great kind of conflict and and, uh, and as you build something. So it's it's got to be so much fun, like you're saying. And we, you know, I call that a mastermind, basically, right? I mean, you, you yeah. put the right, you put people together of all different types of, of skill, and 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 you form a whether you form a forum with them, or it's a once a year thing, whatever it is. It's amazing what comes of it, right? When you when it's just one or two or three or four minds, say, hey, you know, and something cool happens, and, they, and they, they they're they're smart and 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 all, and all that. But when we put many minds together. To, to for a common cause, it's amazing that the the results and you you had the blessings to see that and maybe that's part of your your future right you've been around so many amazing minds you understand what 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 a smart person uh, with no ego looks like and you mentioned that that's a huge huge component to success right they have all the smart people in the world but if they all have egos right. I'd say, wait, that's yeah. my idea. No, that's my idea. I'm not sharing that with you. You, you. you took my idea last time, right? I mean, that doesn't work. It just doesn't work, right? So no. it's fine. You can't, have, you can't have a table full of divas. You will get nowhere. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you know, no opera would be successful with only divas. Yes, they would be spectacular, but it's not an opera. It's not harmony. It's not give and take. There's no rise and fall to that. There's no drama. There's, you can't be all divas. That's why there's only one diva, one prima ballerina. That's it. Like, yes. you know, Everyone yes. else has to be highly collaborative. Yeah. Awesome. Now you, you explained the moonshot very well. So I, I think you probably oh. explained it better in the article. So <laughs> no, I highly doubt that, but thank you. No, no it is, it's really core to understanding the magic of, of these, these kind of minds, these kind of companies that are trying to do things that are, have never been done before. When you're doing that, you have to be in that mind space of, of just wanting to learn and to, and you have to be very, very clear on one, your corporate culture, because that's what creates that collaborative, safe space to experiment and fail. And then you also have to be, you have to be passion driven. I mean, I'm grateful to work with CEOs who, they had enough money a long time ago. They, did, they do not need to work as hard as they do. They're there because they really believe they're changing the world in really important ways. And if you're working at a place that you're like, gosh, why is my CEO just not delivering at that level? They might not be in their passion space. It might just be they can't get that extra gear. And I've, I've asked myself that question when I'm looking for what's the right next adventure for me? What's, what could possibly challenge me in the same way that Amazon and Google did? I'm looking for like something's going to hit me in my chest and be like, that's it. That's the passion project I was looking for to, you know, dedicate myself to. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. that magic. I mean, I, is it is it you know you being the lead consultant in a company that consults to many many companies and you and you you add great minds that to be on your team right 
that can represent, you know, your values, right, as they listen in and they're yeah. parts of boards of, they're on boards of companies, they're consulting to companies, right, and it's your mm -hmm. brand driven by your values. I mean, I, 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 I couldn't imagine the power of a company like that, you know. Um, so yeah. that, 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 you're I, hired. I, Thank you for creating I, my, my vision statement for me. <laughs> yeah, I'd be, I'd be interested in hiring. Yeah, that's for sure. We've got, we've got some needs. And actually, that, that, the one company I tell you about, we still haven't you know, built our board. We have to build a board for that company. And it's a company that, that should be you know, a $100 million company within a few years and, and could be a billion-dollar company within you know, 10 years or so, let's say. But, it, but it's, it's, it's all because they're serving a niche that's, that's never been served before. Uh, they're scratching a niche, serving a niche, whatever you want to say, right? That's never been served before in a way that's faster, less expensive, more, you know, more power and information than ever before. And so it's really fun, but, but if we don't have the right team and we don't, we don't put the right leader in place and have the right team to surround that business, it'll never get there. It'll be, oh, yeah, we, we were the first ones to do that, you know, but uh, wait, wait, where are you now, right? We could be, you know, all those companies that are left behind and these great ideas. So we, we have to make sure you do that. Robbie actually is part of that business and all, all you know, Robbie's a young executive that's, um, that's, that's, you know, pushing the growth of all these businesses and, and, and he's, he's the person. So there's people like Robbie right now that are getting a ton out of this. He's a good listener. I talk too much. Robbie, what, what, do, what do you got? What are some thoughts you got out of, out of this so far? This Anne is awesome. She's uh I think she's one of the best, uh, one of the best people we've had so far on Ditch Digger, as far as uh, the, the nuggets of, of amazing uh, uh, you know, knowledge that we've 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 harvested out of this girl, this young girl. So, tell, tell, so, so Ro Robbie, tell us what you got out of this so far. Yeah, I'll second and I'll triple that actually, and that's actually how what I was going to say to start is I think first instinctually I find myself to be an extrovert, but this conversation I've been perfectly content just being an innocent bystander and soaking up the information. I, I think that speaks volumes to the value that all listeners are going to have out of this. Uh, I, typically, I can't shut my mouth. So if I'm quiet, it is that I'm finding a ton of value in it. Uh, no, but I, I really actually, your story hits home with me. Uh, so my mom and, and dad growing up, it seemed to be really similar to your parents. So my mom's uh, naturally an artist and uh, her number one passion for life was to be a, a mom, actually. And so she, throughout my entire upbringing, always put us and my other siblings first and through that process taught me what it means to be selfless. And my dad on the other end was taught me what it means to work hard and how to value uh, a career and what you want to gain out of that career and become passionate in that. Uh, so I found that part really interesting. And then even further, I, I felt like there was a ton of alignment is uh, prior to joining the Raybine Group and specifically Site Technologies that Gary is referencing, uh, I was at LinkedIn for four years, and mm -hmm. and so I spent some time out in Silicon Valley. And while just I, down the street. Yeah, yeah. Actually, we were uh, while we were out there, we were still on the Mountain View campus. So I actually spent some time in Mountain View. Uh, so through that funny story about LinkedIn, Reed Hoffman came to meet with um, my manager once, and while waiting for her created my LinkedIn account because <laughs> he was horrified in that one. Yeah. <laughs> like one of the first like couple thousand. <laughs> yeah, now they're at like 650 million. Uh, it's insane. Yeah. Uh, but during my time there, uh, I was able to learn from Jeff Weiner, uh, obviously the CEO of LinkedIn, of what it means to be a compassionate leader and ultimately have something that I strive to embody as I'm growing through the Raybine group of companies right now. Uh, but during some of my conversations with clients, I actually stumbled into a conversation with uh, Mo Gadot on his moonshot for One Million Happy. Uh, yeah, I and, love Mo. Yeah. And for me personally, I, I do believe that the mindset is a differentiator between success and failure. Not, maybe not success and failure, but uh, pursuit of what uh, ultimately you're most proud of. And so I've studied a lot about po positive psychology and uh, was beyond grateful that I was able to have that, those conversations and assist however I best could while I was at LinkedIn. And so my, my motto that I live by is celebrate an everyday like it's Friday. And I, just, I think that to everybody can mean something different. But to me, I think everyone comes into Fridays with a different outlook on life. And there's no reason you can't carry that every day. Uh, but, that. but kind of speaking then to one of the questions that I had for you actually is, while I was at LinkedIn, obviously, I became fascinated around the talent landscape, both in the U.S. as well as globally. And something that we were talking about more and more consistently during my last few months while I was there was that 
uh, I was on the nonprofit team for my last few months there and, and helping nonprofits actually hire and retain the right talent. And one thing became clearly evident is that talent is di distributed equally, but opportunity is not. And, sure. and so in your opinion, how do you think that we can solve for something like that as a collective society? Well, I, I love that great minds like you are even asking those questions because it, it, it's so needed. There's so much, so many talented people out there who just need a chance. Um, so I, right now, I have several high-level CEO clients who pay my bills, but I have, I am spending that to build a platform to give as much information and lessons learned for free to as many young entrepreneurs as possible. Because when I started consulting, I would meet people at conferences and these young entrepreneurs would come and be like, I know I can't afford you, but can I ask you just one question? Could I buy you a copy? And I'd be like, yes, I'd rather talk to them than people who can pay you know, consulting firms, whatever they want to, to get their expert opinion. Um, and then I got more and more and more of those requests and it's just not scalable. So I've actually just um, a month ago started my website and Hyatt.co where I'm trying to, I'm starting just, just getting started writing as many articles as I can getting out of my head. That's what my book is about. It's about getting as many of those lessons learned and things I've done and get it out there. Um, so I'm trying to do things here in my community. I've got people I'm mentoring there, but I want to scale it massively. And I wish just more people just invested in sharing what they've learned, especially those things that to you now feel so obvious and dumb. You're like, well, everyone knows that. The truth is they don't. That's right. what I found is like the stuff that comes easy for me now. I forget I learned it the hard way a long time ago. And so I, I think even just you starting a conversation, us talking about like, what young person do you know? Um, you know, thinking about asking yourself, like, what do I wish I had known my, my first year of university or when I was choosing my first job after, after college? What do I wish I'd known about, like, the truth of what senior management actually thinks? Like, the fact that they all feel like they're making it up as they go is so liberating so that we don't self-select ourselves out of opportunities. So I think there's a lot we can do just by having those conversations. And I think a big key of that is getting outside of your normal bubble. Don't stay in your bubble of, I'm talking like on social media, I'm talking about literally around tables, like mix in people that you've never been exposed to have expertise or interests or background different from you. And I learned that from Eric because um, when he stopped being CEO of Google and he became chairman, we spent a full year designing what that job was going to look like. He had never been a chairman before and Google had never had one before. So we had to literally define it from the ground up. And we spent that whole first year doing what we call the listening tour, where we would just put him in a room with people he'd never seen before who were outside of his network and create some, some new conversations and inspire some new synergies. And I can't tell you how much that blew the doors off of our impact over the next, the following six years, had we not been humble enough to sit in that room and invite new conversations around different tables. So I think there's something that us as non-billionaire celebrity CEOs can do in our community to create a space of mixing opportunities. For me, if I just had to choose one arena, I would, I would go straight to universities. I would love nothing more than just sit with those undergrads, those grads, those PhDs, and just help them implement this next generation of ideas because that's, that's, they're inventing the future, not me. So if I can just help them do that faster, that's where I go. I don't know. Did that really answer the question? No, it definitely did. But the, the idea of the university is something I've been thinking about pretty consistently recently. Mm -hmm. uh, the only outcomes that I walk myself to is that, it, one, the university is successful, but obviously I want to, obviously, on the other side of the fence as well is, are there better sure. outputs to that? And my only peak of curiosity that comes from thinking through that alternative is that, for me, I feel like we've recognized, even just in this conversation today, that your formidable years when you're 10 years old yeah. or younger actually ended up playing a bigger uh, outcome in your life when it came to what you actually implemented on a regimented basis and it just became habitual. So I'm wondering, is, like, is it actually your earlier years that we need to focus on prior to university? And I could be wrong, but it's- I love, No, I think you're exactly right. I-, I I couldn't agree more. When Google realized we, we really started focusing on lack of diversity, and at first the, the go-to excuse is like, well, there isn't, just isn't the same pipeline of talent for female engineers as there is for men. And then we decided that's a BS excuse. Let's create the pipeline. It's, it's, women are as good, um, if not better performers in math and science at STEM 
um, as boys until I think it's like age eight or something. And then they start self-selecting out because they're told they don't see examples of women in those classes. Mm. I, I worked my first two and a half years at Google. I worked for Marissa Meyer, who went on to be CEO of Yahoo. And Marissa was the first female engineer hired at Google. She was employee number 20. And she went to Stanford. She's got a master's degree in artificial systems. She's a brilliant computer scientist. And she heard someone talking in the hall. They're like, have you seen that blonde girl who's in the like advanced, whatever, I can't remember what the class is called. And she perked up and she was like, there's another girl in my class. She didn't realize they were talking about her. She is the only one in the room. And I think she was just very special because she could ignore the fact that she didn't look like anyone else. She was a spectacularly beautiful woman. Um, and that had nothing to do with how she self-defined. And what a gift. Like yeah. that, she was just like, she was just one of the guys. And not many people can do that for themselves. If you walk into a room and you're the only one who doesn't look like you, you're going to, you're going to try, you shrink a little bit. So I, I love that you're thinking about like, how can we get STEM camp, you know, which are really popular in Silicon Valley. How can that be a more popular thing that gets young girls feeling comfortable and like they belong in science and engineering? Like, I, I, yeah, go do it, Robbie. Like, yeah. I'm with you. <laughs> well, listen, I know, I'd, I'd love to continue that conversation with you. Obviously, yeah, I want to be respectful time today. I know a lot of people who are working in that space, actually, who, who this is where they're focusing their energy. And there's some great people to, to connect with on that. Yeah. On the policy side, too. Right. Yeah. And, and, and is, hey, Robbie, and, and uh, Anne, is there enough, right, um, in my opinion, you know, when, when, I, when I look at engineering and, and uh, you know, uh, you know stu people that come out of engineering degrees and stuff, they don't, they don't seem to have had any type of experience in risk taking and, and entrepreneurship and all that. Is there, is there a way to, is there a way to get after the, these, these universities that are the best in, in technology and, and, and maybe they're doing already. You may know about it where they're cross collateralizing, you know, the, the, the mindset of risk taking and, and entrepreneurship along with that engineering uh, education they're getting. But I, I just think that's so important. As you said, you know, smart people, uh, with no egos, right? Smart people that also maybe can take risk and understand the the you know, the, uh, the odds of success with risk they take and such. Is there yeah. anything else out there like that as well? At Stanford is it? I mean, there's a reason they're the number one university now, and I think it's they identified that about ten years ago, and no one else is even now maybe having those conversations. You're exactly right. So what they did with their um, engineering program is they inserted classes on entrepreneurship, business ethics. Like you think because you have these kids who have been best in class their whole life. They've always been smart, the smartest person in the room. And they've obviously been very focused on being perfect, yes. on getting the perfect score, getting the perfect grades. That's the only way you get into Stanford, right? But you have those people who, if you're stuck in that performance mindset, you've always been number one. You come to a place where suddenly you're, you know, a little fish in this big pond, it can be really unnerving. And they, they saw a lot of talent drain because of that, because they were no longer perfect. So they had to insert some courses around risk taking, value of failure, um, you know, just creating an environment where it's safe to fail. And um, so that's where they, they created this balance of courses. And that's why they became the number one NBA to get, that's why that level of thinking changes everything. Whereas if you have more traditional models, especially in STEM education, there's no reward for risk. You have to be perfect. You have to publish. You have to be, you know, there's just, and then you don't get really interesting companies coming out of that. And you sure. see that in universities in, in Europe that don't celebrate that. Like Germany is amazing at engineering because they have structure and respect around that. But if you don't see a lot of risk taking, yeah, in Sweden, for example, I lived in Sweden for two years during undergrad. And um, in Sweden, that's the biggest challenge they have around innovation is because they, they are so community minded, which makes them beautiful, wonderful people. They're so community minded. They don't want to let anyone down. They don't want to be a disappointment. They don't want to rock the boat. They're, you know, they don't. They never want to have an ego bigger than someone else's. In Sweden, it's rude to use a title for someone. You would never say, "Oh, hey, Dr. Harris, can I ask that?" You would never say "doctor" because that implies a difference between mm -hmm. values and people. So they they come from this place of beautiful respect. But you don't get a lot of innovation when you're when you're constantly like I don't want to pop my head up because I don't want to pretend I'm better than you. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what, and I, yeah, that's kind of back to the same thing we said. When, you know what the, the classy, smart uh, women in my, in my life, right, have lacked sometimes. You know, jumping forward when I know they'd be the best person to do it. But, you know, my wife has been an example of all her life. My daughter. I, I sit, my assistant Debbie and many, many women around me are just awesome. I'm like, man, take a lead. You should be the CEO of this or that. And anyway, I, I think it's something to focus on in the future for sure. Um, 
I, I, I love it. And, and again, my, what, do you, what do you think of, I mean, so I, I've been uh, on a couple of entrepreneurship boards uh, for a couple of colleges and stuff. And, and, and what I re- realized was the people on the board, there's, there's only a few entrepreneurs and then there's, then there's the professors and administration. And, I, and I'm always bothered that, uh, you know, in my case, that some of these, some of these others um, never have been uh, risk takers, never have been in the, in, in the entrepreneurship world, and they're, and they're guiding these kids in, in these classes for MBAs and entrepreneurship degrees. Um, and, and, and then on, on, the, on, the, on the other thing that, that I see is they actually don't, they, they, they don't value free enterprise as much as I would like, would expect them to, right? So, so again, that, that's a hindrance on, if you get entrepreneurship schools that, that don't value free enterprise, uh, that I should, you know, the administrators or the, the professors, uh, that's, that always bugs me. I, I'm like, I, I, I don't want to participate as long, as long as I would otherwise when I'm getting, you know, I'm getting bad feedback on a consistent basis because I talk about free enterprise on a constant basis and they don't, some don't like that. Um, so that's, it's just like big conflict. I don't know if you've seen that at all in the, in the university, but are there some universities that, that their, their, uh, their staff, the professors are, have been in the working world, have been uh, business builders in, in the past more than others? Yeah, I, I think you're exactly right in the inherent value of having been out there and tried it out and learned a bunch of things the hard way. I do think it's possible to be a pure academic and get it. There's, there's a few examples. Yeah. Um, Yale has an amazing MBA program that actually doesn't, in my opinion, doesn't get the respect it is due because they've taken exactly this very innovative, experimental kind of, that, it, that's the community they've created, is people who are taking risks and doing things, and that you wouldn't expect that from Yale. Yale's very yeah. in other departments. Like, it, you know, their law school is not like that. It's like very, you know, but they're, for some reason, this little MBA program that's very centered around innovation has really done that well. Um, but I... Um, Clay Christensen um, was an amazing, pure academic around business innovation. He just passed away a few months ago of cancer. But he was an example of a pure academic who I think got it, but that was because he had a very strong personal inner moral compass, and he was very passion and pur- purpose-driven in his academics. Um, he, I, I, So there are these anomalies of people who can do it without having like lived the life of it. Yeah, were, living but they're experience. rare. They're rare. I think you do need to diversify your staff and the people who are, in fact, Eric is a good example of this. So Stanford has a program in their MBA program that brings in like all these CEOs and it's, it's a class in entrepreneurship and he co-taught that with, um, with one of their professors. And he just brought in all these amazing stars like Travis to talk about Uber and, um, oh gosh, he just flew out of my brain, the CEO of Snap, um, who had been one of his students in that same program he brings them back and he breaks it down of like what were the critical moments what did you learn what was there like this close to failure kind of moment and, sure. and they just talk about failing 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 until you see the value um and you you it loses the sting a little bit it loses the stigma it's not i mean silicon valley celebrates it you can't get any money from a vc company in silicon valley unless you've had three failed startups at least because you haven't learned enough you know Absolutely. So, Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And if everybody wants the, the person that did the big, you know, that, that uh, was successful in that one for their first deal and that, not everybody, but some people do it. Boy, that's, that's not, that's not who I'm looking for. Right. And, and I don't think any smart in- investors are. I mean, in yeah. Israel where I, I studied, you know, the entrepreneurship in Israel and I, and I love going I there. I spent a lot of time there. Yeah. And, and the VCs that I know there and the, and, the, and the private equities people I know there are that they're looking for those that fail a few times, as you said, that you know, smart people they learn their lessons from the failures, and they, and they know that they're they're ready for success, right? Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's and, and people don't think that way as much as you would think, but you need to. So yeah. awesome, boy. And you know, we we've we've uh, burned up a lot of your time here today, and we could talk to you for for another day or two. Uh, if you, yeah, we realize that's not that, that's not that would be very nice of us to you know to have you you know talking to us at four or five o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, <laughs> your husband's ready to get up and pop out of bed. Right. And still talk. That wouldn't be right. So we're, 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 we, we have to, we have to cut you off because you, you know, we're, we can burn up way more of your valuable time if we, if you let us and you're too nice. Yeah. So, uh, Robbie, you know, we, we, we like, we like to grab the nuggets out of this. And I got so, so many doggone nuggets out of this. It's, it's crazy. Um, you know, uh, but, but Robbie's the, Robbie is the, uh, the mind that picks up on about everything. I, I would just say, you know, Hey, Again, another another uh, amazing mind that you are. That that you know, I, I can feel the greediness in you, and, and, and you know, you're 
uh, you know, the beautiful, beautiful woman that you are, right? People would see from the outside, oh, you know, she's probably, you know, she's, she's probably nice and she's probably kind of, you know, uh, polite and nice. So she probably wouldn't get the toughness out of it. Well, you know what? You, you definitely, you know, bring some toughness to, you, to, to, to any, any leadership position, which I, I love, I, you know, love seeing. Um, your, 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 your background has, has delivered that to you, your family, your upbringing. Um, so I, I like the grittiness in you. Um, I, so many little nuggets I got out of the same thing you said, you know, you know, make sure you're calling on the quiet people. I don't think we do that enough. Uh, call on the quiet people. They're usually probably, you know, thinking things through and, yeah. uh, and, and they've probably got the best things to, to say compared to that person like me that talks too much too often. Um, uh, also, you know, bottom up innovation. I mean, same thing, right? Listen to those that, that are new on the team, right? And, 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 and expect uh, them to fail, allow them to fail so that, so that and, and allow them to, 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 to experience the glory of innovation and, and discovering things, right? Um, uh, the, you know, I, I've got a ton, but, uh, you know, I, I think the, the one, one thing that you say, which, which is something we all have, have to look for when we look at, we look at friends in our life even, right? But when you look at leadership and, and people we want to surround ourselves with, right? Smart people, no egos, right? Smart people, no egos. It's easy. I mean, it's, it's, it's fairly easy to identify too because selfish, selfishness is, is uh, you know, pretty prevalent. It shows its face pretty fast where selfish, selflessness, right? Is, uh, uh, it, it's, it's something we, you know, if, we, if we have in our lives with our family, our friends, our, 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 our teammates, uh, we're going we're gonna to have great lives. And so it's those smart peoples with no ego that I think are so invaluable in our lives. So that, that's something I really take away too. Robbie, uh, you, you go ahead and capture, you show us a few of those other nuggets you captured because there's, there's so many to mention here. Yeah, seriously. Uh, well, I think you kind of stole a couple of mine, but I'll, I'll run with the other ones that I have too. <laughs> uh, I, I usually like to think about it chronologically through our, throughout our conversation. Uh, so back all the way to the beginning, one of the first things that you shared was that uh, your, your father really taught you that there's an, an, an innate voice within all of us uh, and you need to listen to that voice and ultimately trust it and have confidence in yourself uh, and don't lose that over time. Uh, I think it's important that uh, regardless of the societal pressures that are put on, uh, mainly females, but males and females can also have a, a similar experience in that. Uh, you need to make sure that ultimately you're chasing after your dreams and don't settle for anything less than what makes you happy. Uh, the, the next one is actually one that Gary kind of touched on, but I, I, I want to add on to that, which is that you need to ultimately understand that everyone in the room has a voice. And I think t- you can take that and transcend it across an entire organization. And it's important to listen to the feedback of all your employees. Uh, but then taking that a step farther is it's not just diversity of thought, it's diversity as diversity stands by its true definition. Uh, and being able to embrace that as an organization. Uh, the, the next one is in relation to your book, uh, which everyone should read. Uh, mm-hmm. And it could be called Say Your Name. Uh, so if it ends up being the final title, then fantastic. Uh, but ultimately, it just means that we don't need perfection. Uh, in yeah. that it, it's important that as we move for, forward, that failure is okay. Uh, and that's going to be a, a robust change that the... Uh, both the United States economy as well as the global economy need to recognize that it, failure is truly where you learn what it means to be successful. Uh, and, it, and ultimately that those aren't learnings that you're going to get by reading a book. So you just need to go in and, and turn thought into action. And I, I think my last one to really summarize everything is, uh, it seems to be a common theme here, but ultimately if you feel unqualified or underqualified for a role, uh, I want every listener to understand that at the end of the day, there are steps that you can be taking to mitigate that skills gap or the knowledge gap. And for you personally, that was paying attention to the subtle cues of what Jeff Bezos was reading, what he was listening to. Uh, and ultimately through that process, you understand what's on their mind and the problems they're trying to solve. And then through that process, ultimately you can make yourself better as a result. Wow. Gosh, that was so rewarding to hear what resonated with you. Um, I've lived in this crazy world that's seemingly from another planet where to me, all of this stuff is so normal. And to just hear that that resonates and those were innovative ideas and things that you could carry forward and and gift to other people is is really satisfying. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. You you are a gem, and you're you're going to be a blessing to so many people in your life going forward. Uh, it's it's uh, fun to know you, and 
we are we're really just excited and happy that we had the opportunity to spend a little time with you today, Anne. So I really appreciate you. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I'll tell you what, uh, this is going to be a great one uh, again. And you, uh, you're an all-star, and, uh, and you, uh, you know it confidently, but uh, class, classy, in a classy way. And, and it's so much fun to, to listen to you. So uh, thanks so, so much for your time, and uh, really appreciate it. So until uh, till next time on Dish Digger CEO, see ya.